Brenda, and thank you, David. Appreciate you, brother. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to part two of three on becoming the Elijah Church. Those of you who heard part one will remember that we looked at how Elijah was a man just like us, but how he was also a type and a forerunner. Amongst other things, a type and a forerunner of the kind of prophetic church, the Elijah church, that God wishes to raise up in these last days. A church that will tell for the word of God, foretell the word of the Lord. A church that will be a doer of the word, that will manifest the kingdom, that will move in kingdom power and war in the spirit hallelujah in the course of that we looked at emerging from nowhere stepping out of a place of security and bringing health healing hope and life in part two we're going to look at confronting false prophets dealing with doubt fear death and despair and going back the way that we've come and the source texts we won't have time to read them sadly i will refer to them here and there the source text of first kings chapter 18 starting from verse 19 and going through the whole of the rest of that chapter first kings 19 verses 1 through 18 so you might want to have those available in front of you just to reference as we're going through at the end of our last session together we talked about how the Elijah Church embraces its season of preparation and refining, knowing that preparation plus refining equals power. Praise God. And that's the platform from which we now come, that platform of power to look at confronting false prophets. Confrontation with the false prophets in the land was a necessary precursor to what God had in mind to accomplish through Elijah when he stood before the people on Mount Carmel. But it was not, in fact, the end point. What the Lord had determined in his sovereign wisdom he was going to do was to bring relief from drought to Israel. You remember that uh, Elijah had told Ahab, that the heavens would be stopped up and would give no rain until Elijah said otherwise. Now, 1 Kings 18, verse 1, God tells Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. That's God's heart. That's God's intent. But in order for rain to come, the people needed to choose to recognize the Lord as God because it was turning back to him in trust and in faith, which was going to release divine forgiveness and blessing. And in order for the people to have the freedom to make that choice, to turn back to the one true God, the stranglehold of idolatrous leadership, false prophecy and idol worship had to be broken. Does that sound familiar? You bet it does, because our people in this nation are under the stranglehold of idolatrous leadership and false prophecy and idol worship. And until the Elijah church comes to war in the spirit and break that stranglehold, people are not going to be free to choose. God wants freedom for people. He wants people to have choice, ideally to choose him, but at any event to make a free choice. Ungodly leadership sees true prophecy as a threat. It prefers by far to take refuge in comforting falsehoods instead of facing up to uncomfortable truths. When Elijah turns up in front of Ahab, the king greets him by saying, what do you want, you troubler of Israel? That's how the world views the Elijah church a troubler, a troublemaker. The message of the gospel is disturbing to the world. 
And anybody who faithfully proclaims it can expect to be accused of the same things that the believers were accused of in Acts 17, causing trouble all over the world. But slander and name-calling don't deflect the Elijah church from its course. In the face of bluster and threats, the Elijah church instead calmly offers the correct diagnosis. And so Elijah responds to Ahab, I've not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Again, look where we are in this nation. Look at the elites who have made trouble for this nation and its people because they've abandoned the true God and followed false gods. This same message that Elijah gave to Ahab is one that the Elijah church needs to give today to our leaders, both religious and secular, and indeed to the nation at large. The Elijah church does not take orders from secular authorities because it understands that they have no right to dictate as concerns spiritual matters. The Elijah Church correctly discerns and applies God-given distinctions between spheres of authority. When you read the scriptures, you see the spheres of authority that the Lord has set up. There's a personal sphere of authority. There's a family sphere, a religious sphere, and a secular sphere. When you start mixing up those spheres of authority, when one sphere of authority starts meddling where it's no right to meddle, you're in for trouble. We saw that during COVID when the secular authorities attempted to dictate to the religious authorities when and how they could open churches. For example, but the Elijah Church rightly divides the word of God as between submitting to governing authorities on the one hand, Romans 13, 1, and obeying God rather than man on the other, Acts 5.29. As the Elijah church emerges in its full power and anointing from God's time of preparation and refining, it wields its proper spiritual authority over the secular world. Because what happens in the spiritual determines what happens in the physical, not the other way around. First, the spiritual, then the physical. And so it's vital that the Elijah church should speak prophetically into the nation. Just look what happened as Elijah appears in front of Ahab. He gives orders to the king. First Kings 18, verse 19. Elijah says to the king, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table while you're about it. Hallelujah. And the king, this evil king, who we read earlier, had been searching all over the place, overseas as well as within Israel, to find Elijah in order to imprison him at best and kill him at worst. This king, as the man in front of him now, not only does he take no action against Elijah, but he meekly does as he said. It shows us that the Elijah church is untouchable for as long as God decrees. We see this, in fact, in Revelation 11, when the prophetic witnesses to the nations appear. The two witnesses, you remember one of them, a type of Moses, one of them, a type of Elijah. They have power to shut up the sky so it won't rain during the time that they're prophesying. And in exactly the same way, the Elijah church will continue its work until it's finished its testimony. At present, our people waver between two opinions. You can't blame them. They're doing that because the Elijah church hasn't yet emerged to challenge them over it and to demonstrate to them the powerlessness 
of idols and false prophecy in the face of Almighty God. Hallelujah. The prophets of Baal in this nation are having a high old time. They are shouting and slashing themselves that the Elijah church is caused, called to expose their delusion and taunt their foolishness, just as Elijah did on Carmel. Notice the place that was chosen for this confrontation, by the way, how often in the scriptures and in our own history, you see resonances down the ages as there is a further outworking of the purposes of God as things that were done in the physical then come to be done in the spiritual. This place, Carmel, again, Elijah being taken into a stronghold of the enemy. It's just over the border from the Phoenician states where Jezebel's father ruled. It's very close to Jezreel, where Ahab had a citadel and fortress. But it was the location of a great battle between Israel on the one hand, led by Deborah and Barak, and the Canaanites under their general Zara, generations and generations before. This was where the valley of the Kihon River is. And Baal's prophets are going to be wiped out at the Kihon River, the Kishon River, I should say, just as Caesarea's army was all those generations before. Deborah and Barak confronted the earthly powers that were oppressing Israel in their day. And now God, through Elijah, is going to deal with the spiritual powers that are orchestrating things behind the scenes in the Israel of his time. The Elijah church is similarly to step forward and deal with those spiritual powers that are orchestrating things behind the scenes in the nations. As it does so, the Elijah church is innocent as a dove. It is holy, but it is wise as a serpent. It does not allow the world to use its virtues against it or to trap it into metaphorically putting its head in a noose. Elijah stands before the people and he says, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. Well, he knew that that wasn't strictly true because just a short while earlier, Obadiah, the man in charge of Ahab's palace, had told him how he had hidden a hundred prophets of the Lord in caves. Later on, of course, God's going to tell Elijah he's reserved to himself 7,000 in Israel who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. So Elijah is telling a very qualified type of truth. It was true in the sense that he was the only one of the Lord's prophets, not then in hiding. In these days, we need to be funny in the Lord about how we deal with the state and how we deal with the enemy. In the Second World War in 1944, when Dietrich Bonhoeffer was arrested, suspected of complicity in a plot to assassinate Hitler, he was tortured and interrogated by the Gestapo, and they wanted him to implicate other people in that plot. And Bonhoeffer, wrestling with what it means to serve and adore and worship the God of truth, who calls us to speak truth, came to the conclusion that in these particular circumstances, with these particular individuals, he did not owe them the truth. There on Carmel, after the prophets of Baal have fruitlessly done what they wanted to do, Elijah steps forward and he says to the people, come here to me. The Elijah church will call the people to it. And like Elijah did on Carmel, it will repair the altar of the Lord in the land. When the Elijah church offers its sacrifices to the one true God, fire from heaven will fall. 
there will be a manifestation of kingdom power in the Elijah church. And then the people will know the Lord, he is God. And then they will join with the Elijah church in ridding the land of the false prophets of Baal. You know, false prophecy is all around us. Jesus tells us that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. When he lies, he speaks his native language. And Satan is busy releasing lies over nations, over regions, over peoples, over institutions. He's seeking to pervert and deny what God has made them to be. Those lies take all sorts of different forms. They can be in the claims made by false religions and ungodly ideologies. They can be in the statements made by broadcasters, our own dearly beloved BBC, a past master releasing lies over the nation. However they are manifested, whoever said them, these lies operate as false prophecies or as curses, and they need to be treated as such. God's people have power to cancel curses in the name of Jesus. We have power to speak blessing in their place, to call forth divinely appointed destinies, which is what true prophecy is, to refute every enemy attempt to kill, steal, and destroy. The Elijah church comes in the opposite spirit to the evil one and his servants. Where they pronounce death, it proclaims life in all its fullness. A cascade of satanic falsehood has been spoken over our nation in recent years. It tells us Britain is uniquely to blame for climate change because we were the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. It tells us that our people and our institutions are irredeemably racist, that any attempt to assert the primacy of the nation state and our constitution is bigoted and deplorable, that the United Kingdom is united no more and is destined to split apart, and so on and so on. Every single one of those assertions is demonstrably untrue. It can be countered rationally through evidence and argument. But these things also need to be confronted and defeated in the spiritual realms, and that's part of the job of the Elijah Church. You know, one of Satan's greatest desires is for the body of Christ to agree with his lies, because then they become true in the eyes of the world. So the Elijah church is very careful indeed what it agrees with and what it gives its assent to. It understands that that agreement and assent can be expressed positively, but it can also be expressed by silence. And so it stands on the truth of the entirety of God's word, remembering that the text taken out of contact, is a pretext. The Elijah church contends with the arrogant and wicked who use their tongues to take possession of the earth, Psalm 73. It does that by speaking God's truth and God's purposes, by refuting the lies of the enemy, by rebuilding broken down altars and restoring true worship, and by putting to death metaphorically, spiritually, that which needs to die. What we say and pledge allegiance to matters. It's through declaration that the Elijah's church stands on a right foundation, correcting any deviation from the plumb line of God's unadulterated word. The Elijah church fulfills its God-appointed mission to the full, but it doesn't go beyond what has been set for it at any given point. On Carmel, Elijah confronted and exposed and had put to death 
the prophets of Baal. Nothing at all is said about the prophets of Asherah. Elijah told Ahab to summon them to, as far as we know, the king did so. And so I can only surmise that it was not God's intention to deal fully with the prophets of Asherah at this point. It was a job for somebody else to perform, not Elijah. Nevertheless, because Asherah was the consort of Baal, Asherah suffered a heavy blow that day, no doubt about it. In a former generation, when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and said that he was bringing judgment on all the gods of Egypt. And in the same way, here on Carmel, the primary contest was not between human beings. It was fought in the spiritual realms. The Elijah church wars in the spirit. It wins victory in the spiritual realms and therefore wins victory in the natural realms. Who? God had already shown his superiority over Baal. He did that the moment Elijah first turned up in front of Ahab in 1 Kings 17 and said, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, there'll be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Baal, supposedly, was the god of the weather. Yet this weather god was unable to bring forth rain. Even three years later, Baal hadn't managed to do that. It was only as Elijah bowed in prayer that a downpour was released. Baal was already defeated. What happened on Carmel was just an outworking of that fact, a demonstration of God's power to king and people and judgment on some of the false prophets in the land. Praise the Lord. But after that great victory, the come down, the Elijah church moves in extraordinary power, and yet it is made up of human be beings with all our faults and our foibles and our failings. None of us is immune to the reality of what it is to be human. And though the spirit is willing, all too often the flesh is weak. We don't have to be ashamed of that. God knows how we're formed. He remembers that we're dust. But neither do we have to like it or accept it meekly. Our weaknesses are there for us to overcome by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit as we're being transformed into Christ's likeness with ever-increasing glory. Hallelujah. And so while the Elijah church doesn't deny the fact of doubt, fear, death, and despair, it rejects their power in the life of a believer. And it moves in faith to overcome their hold wherever they appear. So strongly, was the hand of God on Elijah, that he did things which were physically impossible if he'd been acting purely in human strength. Obadiah, the head of Ahab's palace, recognized that. In 1 Kings 18, he says to Elijah, I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. That sounds to me very similar to what Acts 8 talks about when the deacon Philip is suddenly taken away by the Holy Spirit from the Ethiopian eunuch and appears at Ositus, 30 miles away. That was the kind of power that was at work through Elijah. Knowing that rain was coming, once the people had acknowledged the Lord to be God and the prophets of Baal had been killed, Elijah gave Ahab the message, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. After that, Ahab rode off down Carmel to Jezreel. And the power of the Lord came upon Elijah and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. 
Jezreel was more than 20 miles away. Only through Holy Spirit power could Elijah have outpaced a team of horses over that distance. By the way, tucking the cloak into the belt is a symbol of freeing ourselves for action by laying aside everyday ways of being and doing. The Elijah Church doesn't allow itself to be encumbered by such things. Instead, it gives itself maximum freedom of maneuver so it can respond fully to the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, we've seen how repeatedly Elijah witnessed the power of the Lord. Extraordinary, extraordinary things. He had no objective reason for fear. With that God behind him, how could he fear? And yet, when he heard Jezebel intended to have him murdered, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Once he reached Jezreel, Ahab evidently lost no time telling Jezebel everything Elijah had done, how he killed all the prophets of Baal with the sword. And so it could even have been that very same afternoon, late on, early evening, maybe the same day, when Jezebel's threatening message was delivered to Elijah. And you can just imagine the scene, feeling isolated in his arch enemy's fortress city, suffering the physical and psychological effects of that extreme exertion that he performed on Mount Palmer, experiencing the inevitable come down from the emotional high that must have accompanied everything that happened there. His reaction is totally understandable, but it was based on a lie. Fear is F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And on this occasion, Elijah fell straight into its trap. You might wonder how that could be after everything that had gone on. But very similar thing happened with the Apostle Peter when he was walking on water. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. If we take our eyes off Jesus and what he's doing and instead focus on the things of this world, we're going to open a door for doubt to come in. And when doubt comes in, fear usually isn't far behind. Doubt is the opposite of faith, and faith is one of our spiritual superpowers. It's a mechanism through which God supplies and God does what we can't. It's never a numbers game with the Almighty. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. His all-sufficiency makes good our insufficiency. Faith unlocks divine power. And by faith, Old Testament heroes, Hebrews 11 tells us, conquered kingdoms. God's looking for kingdom conquerors in our own day to take the fight to the enemy and to demolish his strongholds in this land. Jesus promised that his followers would do yet greater things than he had done. And we, brothers and sisters, are the ones who are going to see that scripture made good in our own time and day. Praise God. The Elijah church looked doubt, fear, death and despair full in the face and it overcomes them. And in the process, it becomes a kingdom conqueror. Now, look, I know it's so easy to say this stuff. And it's so hard to walk it. Reaching a point where we overcome those things is not going to be straightforward. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a task necessarily that we do and we've had done with it. We might need to go through that process repeatedly. But just take heart from Elijah's example. He was taken 
to such depths of despair that he prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down and fell asleep. And again, you can just picture the scene. This man feed to a pit of physical and mental and moral and emotional exhaustion. And of course, in a state like that, all of us are vulnerable. We're all likely to have experiences that take us into that sort of territory. Even if we don't quite get to the point of wishing our lives to end, there are going to be times for sure when we simply reach the end of ourselves. We've got nothing else to give. What a blessing that the Bible is so honest about the heroes of the faith. When we read that Elijah was just a man like us, how that should encourage and strengthen us. Because if he can do it, so can we. More to the point, the God who was there to sustain and encourage and empower Elijah, not once, not twice, but over and over and over again, that same God is there for us too. When he fled from Jezebel, Elijah acted in panic. But he wasn't acting irrationally. He was making for Horeb via Beersheba. Beersheba, uh, then at the southernmost border of the kingdom of Judah. We rem remember we're in that time when the United Kingdom of Israel has split. We've got the northern kingdom of Israel, where Ahab was king, kingdom of Judah to the south, and beyond it, territories of traditional Israelite enemies like Edom. Egypt, the wild regions of the Sinai. This is where Elijah is headed, and his first stopping place is Beersheba. It means the well of the oath or the well of seven. It was where Abraham made an oath with Abimelech. It was where Hagar met the angel of the Lord a second time. It was where God met Jacob, where he met Isaac. And you know that the Hebrew language has families of words, often arranged around a three-consonant structure. So the, uh, the family of words that Bia belongs to has a verb associated with it, which is bara. Bara means to clean, to purify, to clarify. Beersheba was the perfect place for Elijah to meet God and receive cleansing, purification, clarification. The Elijah church isn't afraid to admit its shortcomings and its mistakes and to seek these things from God, to seek rectification, recommissioning, clarification, cleansing, purification. It's characterized, this Elijah church, by clarity of thought, clarity of vision, clarity of action, and also by its cleanliness and its purity. In other words, its holiness. You know, fear, doubt, death, and despair, they're each backward-looking conditions for the Christian because God has delivered us from all of them. Second Timothy says he didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Instead of doubt making us like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind, First Peter tells us believers through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed. In the last time. Death has no hold on us because Second Timothy tells us Jesus destroyed death and has brought life and immortality. And in place of despair, Hebrews says we have hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. So when times are hard, we need to make a conscious effort of will to stand firm on these great spiritual truths, even when every outward circumstance 
seems to scream the opposite. I know it's easy to say, and it's difficult to do, but we can't step into the fullness of what the Elijah church is intended by God to be without it. As we all know, there are different levels of maturity in the Christian life, and with each level of maturity goes a corresponding degree of spiritual power. Doubt, fear, death, and despair often stand as gatekeepers at the boundary between one level of maturity and another. Satan intends to use those to bar our entry into higher levels of authority and prevent us progressing in our walk with the Lord. Whereas God wants them to be things through which we learn and grow. The Lord allows them because he knows that fighting against them will cause us to put on spiritual muscle. Reminding ourselves of all of that should help us persevere in the struggle, not allowing ourselves to become disheartened or downcast, not giving up altogether when there's no immediate breakthrough, but instead being willing to dust ourselves off and try again and again and again. Even in its darkest times and places, the Elijah Church makes itself available to receive God's re-equipping, re-envisioning, revitalizing, and redirecting. Look, at one point in his ministry, even the mighty prophet Elijah stumbled. Weakened by exhaustion and the constant strain he'd been under, he looked back. He took refuge in nostalgia, seeking God in how he imagined things used to be. And so in the place where Moses received the Ten Commandments, Elijah thought divine revelation. He was expecting the same manifestations of earthquake, wind, and fire that Israel had seen on that occasion. But instead, what he got was the gentle whisper or the still small voice. Challenged by God, he understood that instead of harking on former glories, he needed to move forward. And that just because the Lord has worked a certain way previously doesn't mean that that's going to, how he's going to do things in the future. Like Paul, when he writes to the Philippians, the Elijah church presses on. Take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of it. It presses on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called it heavenward in Christ Jesus. In doing so, it confronts and overcomes doubt, fear, death, and despair, and it leaves those relics of our former lives trailing in its wake. Praise God. You know, of all the human characteristics, I would say that self-pity has to be one of the least enduring ones. Most of us are prone to it every now and again. I do a nice line in self-pity myself. And there in his dank cave on Horeb, Elijah gave way to it in spades. God asks the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? And yet the prophet twice gave the exact same reply. And you can hear the misery, the self-pity in his voice. I've been very zealous. For the Lord God Almighty, the Israelites, have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Subtext, I've worked hard for God. I've done everything God could possibly ask. It's all everybody else's fault. I deserve better. I'm all on my own. There's nobody to help me. Poor me. How very human and how much it speaks of our attitude 
towards God and his service. Humanity, in all our weakness and childishness and petulance, is here and it's displayed in one of the mightiest prophets of all time. Makes me feel a bit better when I give way to self pity. So often we feel we're the only ones who is really doing anything, the only ones going through a particular experience. In our heart of hearts, we usually know it's not true, but that doesn't stop us bleating. Now, to be fair, there's more than a grain of truth in what Elijah said. He had indeed been God's mighty servant. His zeal was extraordinary. The Israelites had broken covenant with the Lord. The altar of the Lord was broken down. Jezebel had put God's prophets to death, threatened to kill Elijah himself. But Elijah was not the only prophet as the Lord left. He knew it all well. He knew that Obadiah had a hundred prophets hidden in a cave. Shortly, God reminds him he's got 7,000 in Israel who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. When we catch ourselves in the act of allowing self-pity to take us into building a narrative that's not supported by facts, we should take a deep breath and stop. Stop before we descend into becoming blind to God's purposes and deaf to his voice. Elijah had retreated into a cave. It was a physical cave, but it was a cave of the mind as well. And he was busy constructing his own reality rather than seeking God's perspective and divine insight into his circumstance. And so he totally missed the point of God asking, what are you doing here, Elijah? What God put his finger on was that the prophet had come to that place following the devices and desires of his own heart, not because God told him to. In fact, like Jonah, he'd run just about as far as he could get from where God wanted him to be. All he could focus on was what was important to him. Just consider Elijah's situation at this point. He'd prayed to God he might die and he got the exact opposite god sent an angel to bring food to keep him alive he cried out to god in despair and fear and got no direct reply instead he's told to stand on a mountain to see the lord pass by and yet he did not see him in any of the ways that he thought he should what elijah wanted and expected was a God of vengeance, a God of justice, a God of retribution, a God of undisguised power, a God to smite the evildoer and scatter his foes. There's a time for earthquake, wind, and fire. In fact, those things were present at other points in Elijah's ministry. Fire fell on Mount Carmel. A whirlwind took him up to heaven. But this wasn't it. That mighty prophet, whose prayers God so often answered in dramatic fashion, must have felt abandoned, God forsaken, as though he were praying into a void. Do we feel like that sometimes? Yes, of course we do. And of course, it is not true. It is a lie. But you see, for the most part, what calls itself the church in this nation has retreated into a cave. It feels isolated and powerless and threatened by a hostile culture. It looks upon broken down altars to the Lord and an apostate nation without any expectation that situation can meaningfully change. As it gazes wistfully, on past glories, it experiences nostalgia, but it doesn't see an example to be emulated. But at moments like that, the Elijah church holds fast the faith, knowing that God is not a man that he should lie, and that all his promises are true. 
the Elijah church is alert to God speaking even in a gentle whisper or a still small voice. And it responds straight away to the Lord's prompting. When Elijah felt those first faint footfalls of God's presence, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. At this pivotal point in the life of church and nation, the Elijah church does not retreat into a cave, but stands listening and waiting on God. It makes space to be still and know that he is God. God's word to Elijah is his word to the Elijah church. Go back the way you came. If we've taken a wrong track, the only thing for it is to turn round and retrace our steps to where we were last on the right way. Then we can pick up the threads again and walk in the path God has set. That might feel like acknowledging defeat. It might seem like it's more trouble than it's worth. We like to think we're clever enough to find our way back by another route. Sometimes you can do that in the physical, but you can never do it in the spiritual because you can't build a godly structure on ungodly foundations. If the root is wrong, so will the fruit be. Jeremiah is told to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow before he's able to build and to plant. That's because you have to rip things back to godly foundations before you start to build. Otherwise, what we build will be out of plumb. And like anything that's not built according to truth, sooner or later, it will potter and fall. In this nation, we have added a vast superstructure to the so-called church without regard to the plumb line of the word of God. That superstructure is teetering badly, and very, very soon it is going to come down with an almighty crash. The Elijah church recognizes the imperative of God's call to go back the way we've come, and it acts on that call without delay. After God spoke that word to him, the Bible simply says, so Elijah went. God hadn't finished with Elijah. He's not finished with this nation. Hallelujah, glory be to God. And still less has he finished with his Elijah church. The tasks that lay ahead for Elijah were potentially dangerous. He was told to commission a new generation of religious and political leaders to anoint Hazael king over Aram, to anoint Jehu king over Israel, and to anoint Elisha to succeed him as prophet. He was going to be called once again to declare God's righteousness by confronting Ahab over how Ahab stole Naboth's, Naboth's vineyard and put Naboth and his sons to death. Now, I wouldn't much fancy standing in front of Ahab to call him a murderer, but at least you could see how uh, uh, that might be received. But to anoint a successor to the king while that king was still alive was like wishing the original king dead. It was treason. It was to treason that God was calling Elijah to perform. From a worldly perspective, he's telling Elijah to put his head on the block. He's giving Ahab the perfect excuse to have him executed. But this is what picking up where Elijah had left off in his God-given mission looked like. This was what going back the way he had come meant. And the prophet found renewed courage and faith, and he did what God commanded him to do. At this point, 
there's something that we need to confront about what and where the so-called church currently is in this nation and what it has done and failed to do. Our country is in a mess, but it's only in that position because the church has failed to be all that God intends it to be and has equipped it to do. The church is supposed to shepherd and disciple the nation. But in recent decades, that's something that we've either not done at all or done badly. The church is supposed to speak truth to power the way that Elijah did to Ahab, not to be a lapdog of the establishment. The church is supposed to be God's instrument to set the standard for righteous rule in the nation. And God has delegated to it the authority by which he sets up kings and deposes them. The church is commissioned to ensure that the voice of true prophecy will not be extinguished and the word of the Lord will once again be heard in the land. It's commissioned to teach the people God's ways and make known to them his commandments. It has the privilege and the responsibility to make known among the nations what God has done. The Elijah Church embraces those callings and it is not deterred from performing them. No matter what may come against it and no matter what challenges or dangers may lie in the way. Recognizing where it's gone astray, it goes back the way it has come when necessary. And in doing so, it's able once more to move in kingdom power. God says, by me, kings reign and rulers make laws that are just. By me, princes govern and all nobles who rule on earth. He says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he directs it like a watercourse wherever he pleases. The Lord God is sovereign and he does as he wishes. The only constraints on him are those of his own nature. He can't lie, for example. And the commitments that he has voluntarily made, like his covenant promises to Israel. He's God all by himself, and he does not need human beings. But all the same, he has chosen to make believers in Christ his co-laborers, and often he will work through us. The Elijah Church, the body of Christ, is his primary mechanism for engaging with a fallen world. It is not the will of God that this nation should be ruled badly. It is not the will of God that our people should become degenerate physically, morally, and spiritually. It is not the will of God that our institutions should be put to the service of evil. It's not the will of God that our destiny as a nation should be perverted. It's not the will of God that the satanic and the demonic in this nation go unchallenged. God could move in sovereign power to change every single one of those things in an instant. But he wants his Elijah church to arise, to do what he has deputed it to do. For too long, We've seen unrighteous laws passed, people set in positions of rulership God did not give them, false religion and idol worship given precedence by the state, mockers act in way that def ways that defy God and his laws. The Elijah church is God's answer to those things, and he is causing it to go back the way that it has come and to pick up where it left off. Amongst other things, that means 
declaring righteousness and facing down political power. We're going to be looking at that next time. There may seem very little physical sign of it right now. But there is nevertheless the sound of a heavy rain in this land. Prepared in advance for what is to come, the Elijah church tucks its cloak into its belt to give itself maximum freedom of action, and it runs ahead of those who move only in the natural. It goes into the strongholds of the enemy, just like Elijah went into the raw citadel at Jezreel. And there it readies itself to speak with authority and power as the Holy Spirit, in his wisdom, may from time to time erect. Brothers and sisters, that is where we are in this nation now. Amen. 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 <laughs> yeah, we, I just want.